Hegel, um, when he talked about the bourgeoisie, uh, saw them as essentially a private class engaged in the hurly-burly of business. Um, and in this, they're in contrast to the feudal elites who maintain themselves through economic welfare through the direct exercise of political power. The very deep politicisation of the bourgeoisie for Hegel, um, the bourgeois mode of subsistence, meant that they required a state to maintain law and order. Um, they're thrown back upon themselves, he said. Um, they, uh, their feeling of selfhood is most intimately connected with the demand for law and order. Executive government, for its part, depended upon commerce to provide the sinews of state. The state tended towards professionalisation, being staffed by efficient bureaucrats who served the executive, and because this was in the interest of the state to protect its civil society, Hegel thus was optimistic that private freedom and public uh, community of interest or purpose had finally been reconciled um, to the private sphere of business, the public sphere of um, government, been connected essentially by the sinews of taxation, by fiscal sinews. And a century later, Joseph Schumpeter made much the same point. Uh, capitalism divides the public sphere from the private commercial sphere, as never before, and much more so than would be the case under socialism, he said. The spheres were conceptually distinct and drew upon quite different personnel, at least at the level of national government. So as Schumpeter put it, uh, the outstanding feature of commercial society is the division between the private and the public sphere. The state in Schumpeter's, uh, a, a, the state in Schumpeter's view, uh, as in Hegel's view, unified society and gave some kind of ideological shape and destiny to the innumerable interactions of civil society. It is not an independent formation dictating to society, however. Its reliance upon taxation and credit meant that it nurtured commercialism and looked out for the interests of the economic um, uh, actors. The assumption that state and civil society cohered under conditions of commercial modernity was deeply embedded in 19th century liberalism. So, for example, Giacomo Durando, a liberal uh, Ital Italian general and future statesman, writing in 1865, um, made the argument that representative institutions or parliaments mediated between executive and society. Parliaments would vote supply, vote, vote a budget for governments, um, a, and, and provide security for the loans of government. And in return, um, a, parliaments would expect government to protect civil society. The state, indeed, government was spontaneously inclined to, to do so, other, other, why, other, otherwise it risked killing the goose that laid the fiscal golden eggs. Political agency here rested not with the bourgeoisie as such, but with the coincidence of interest between state and bourgeois civil society. So there's not so much a notion of the bourgeoisie taking over the personnel of the state, uh, uh, the bourgeoisie taking over the state, rather there's a community of interest. Okay. Now a good many early socialists took the view that the coincidence of interest between state and civil society should be pushed much further, so that government would lose its atavistic political survivals and become a more or less purely administrative organ, um, a withering away of the political state. This would be realised by political society directly deputising agents to run the state, rather than relying upon a distinct bureaucratic class, itself not directly productive, and therefore all is tempted to batten on civil society and extract rents. Uh, Saint-Simon, um, who is seen as a founder socialist, um, gave extensive advice to King Louis XVIII, explicitly proposing a government of experts drawn from commercial managers Rational economic men would then counteract the excesses of arbitrary government. <coughs> Communist socialists, however, believed that the merging of state and bureaucracy would only serve to annex governmental power to the workplace tyranny of the bourgeoisie. While rational economic organisation was desirable, it should not be at the beck and call of narrow private property, they said. A state resting in privately owned productive properties would only serve to reduce the state to the status of a handmaiden of these particular class interests. As such, it would govern at the expense of society as a whole. 
Only a class without such resources and private productive property could be expected to exercise control of the executive state in the interests of society as a whole. And so for the French revolutionary Gracchus Babeuf, the swelling of the host of propertyless men, as he put it, under conditions of national emergency, created, he said, a once-off opportunity for bringing together economy and state for universal interests. In 1828, uh, Philip Buranati's memoir, Babeuf and the Conspiracy of Equals, launched this apo apotheosis of the propertyless uh, as a staple of uh, socialist circles. The propertyless, because they were about particular, distinct, uh, particular interests distinct from universal interests, not having their own private productive property, um, because they are um, a, indistinguishable from universal interests, they would be prodigious in exertions for these universal ideals. But at the time Baranotti is writing, the proletariat had become obviously a more or less permanent feature of modern society, um, so his apotheosis of them um, went down very well with uh, early socialists. Still, in this view, the proletariat was still considered in more or less negative terms as simply lacking private productive property and therefore being without particular interests. Such a class might well compose a civil society that could absorb the execu bureaucratic executive in the future once bourgeois private property had been eliminated. But this populist proletariat lacked a property form in the here and now. It had no particular property form to defend. That was the point of the proletariat. But because it had no particular interest in the here and now, logically enough, the salvation of the proletariat could only be apparent through, if you like, uh, enlightened ratiocination. It could only be apparent to those sages able to anticipate future societal forms necessarily through a process of uh, theoretical analysis. The proletariat, therefore, in their misery, provided the combustible, combustible material for revolution. Certainly they would be the beneficiaries of a communist society which abolished private property. And in their present propertylessness, the proletariat represented a generalizable social category. However, in the here and now, they could only be educated in their interest. They could not arrive at it intuitively, because collectivism as such was not significantly prefigured in their mode of existence. It could only benefit from the abolition of private property. It could hardly initiate such a revolution or even anticipate it. So if you like, for the utopian socialists, uh, the proletariat at best were a kind of raw material and a, uh, in their mode of social existence and uh, a prefiguring of the ideal future but without having um, a, a property interests of their own they weren't going to be a motivating factor in the revolution they would have to be motivated by others um, now I have the view that the first person to break from this idea is Flora Tristan I think more recently one can make an argument for William Thompson um, and because he's Irish and I'm a national chauvinist, I'd like that to be the case. Um, a William Thompson, a, um, in his writings in the 1820s, a, tried to make the argument uh, that it was the uh, irregularity of income under the market system uh, which would oblige workers to come together um, in order to, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in a collective, collective struggle, in order to, in order to over, overcome the market. And William Thompson is pretty unique amongst the utopian socialists in arguing that the working class themselves would intuitively move towards collectivism rather than having to be educated simply to that end. Now, Flora Tristan, 1843, uh, made a real breakthrough, I think, which isn't appreciated. Um, Flora Tristan is seen as almost the most utopian of all the utopian socialists. Uh, George Lichtenstein has said, uh, said um, and he made the argument that her thinking was typical of females and that it was all very emotional and this kind of thing, which I think is um, generally how Tristan is perceived even today. And I think it's wrong, actually. Um, Trista did identify a proletarian property form existing in the present uh, with interests attached to them. She no longer conceptualised the proletariat as being without property. 
The argument instead is that the property of workers, the property of the proletariat, was the capacity to labour uh, the, and the necessity to labour for wages. This was a property interest which the proletariat would seek to defend. I'll not read out the entire quotation from her, but little bits of it. Um, for the poor worker who possesses neither land nor houses nor capital nor absolutely anything except his arms requires the right to work, the only one that can give him the possibility of using uh, his arms. Therefore, what does the working class demand? It, uh, its own property, the only one that it can ever possess, its arms. Yes, its arms. They are its patrimony, its unique wealth. Its arms are the only instruments of labour in its possession. They therefore constitute its property. And to secure this property requires the organisation of labour. And so the right to work, uh, leading to the organisation of labour, is something which arises intuitively out of the working class mode of existence, out of the defence of its particular form or property. Uh, she wrote this in a, uh, a book which is um, uh, The Workers' Union, uh, but it's identified as a kind of catechism. Um, it's given in this form, that's true, uh, but my argument is that Tristan, in fact, is writing a sociological treatise here, trying to explain uh, the nature of socialist preference formation uh, amongst the working class. Um, now, Tristan's preaching to her across France in the 1840s failed to convince the workers of her cause, uh, and, and the only partial success of this enterprise, and perhaps a, a rather dismissive attitude towards as a woman, have combined to establish a consensus that she is a typically utopian socialist. However, Tristan, in arguing that the property of the workers in practice and indeed in principle was nothing other than the capacity to labour, uh, or arms as she strikingly put it, this property was only of use if paid work could be found to set it in motion. In defending their property, therefore, workers are obliged to demand a right to work. The right to work, in turn, requires the organisation of labour. Otherwise, paid employment, dependent upon capricious market circumstances, would be insecure at best or altogether absent for some. Now, I'd like to find out that uh, Marx was deeply influenced by Tristan, um, and the dates fit, actually. Um, it is in 1844 that Marx quite suddenly converted to championing proletarian agency as the motivating force behind socialist, uh, socialist revolution. However, I can't prove this direct connection. Uh, I'm not going to hear develop, I'm not going to detail the development of Marx's thinking on the proletariat's inherent capacity for developing socialist pro, uh, 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 for developing socialist preference formation because I've written an article about it. So I'll just be schematic about it. Um, Marx, if you like, uh, comes up with ideal typical classes. Each class has a typical mode of subsistence, the form of endeavour by which they live which operates on a particular form of property accessed by the individual. Together we might term this the mode of existence, uh, to borrow a term Marx frequently uses. Each mode of subsistence is, is potentially fettered, and indeed in a class society is likely to be so. A class individual spontaneously infers from their mode of existence a vision of ideal conditions for its security. This is the mode of existence with, with, with its fetters struck off. For Marx, individuals typically practice their means of living in a particular fashion determined by means and relations of production. So doing generates a particular class ideal. This class ideal is not the eliminating of the mode of existence, but its emancipation from conditions that in a social formation of competing class interests attach themselves and are, and as, and are perceived as fetters. And so individuals are essentially looking for uh, a, a security based upon a steady ground for their mode of existence, whatever that might be. So for example, if you're a slave, you idealise labouring as a free man. A peasant will idealise um, farming as an owner-occupier. 
An artisan will idealise manufacturing as a skilled worker, assured of a just price for honest work. Uh, the moral economy of Thompson. Now, the exploiting classes, um, they, of course, uh, don't labour directly. They do, however, seek to emancipate their mode of existence from perceived fetters. So feudal elites are, rel- are, are restlessly political in the sense of exercising ritualised military, religious and courtly power. This paradoxically arises from the desire for security. Security for feudal elites is roughly to be found in territorial power. Territorial power is legitimised by recognition for fellow aristocrats and to a substantially lesser degree the general populace. Um, so your feudal lord uh, to maintain his mode of existence is particularly into um, authority uh, uh, um, th- um, through feudal norms, uh, chivalry, that kind of thing. Now, capitalists are equally restless in the mode by which they make a living. They are locked in competition with other capitalists and they are driven to maximise market share by any expedient. If they do not strive to maximise their market share, they risk seeing that market share being snatched away by other more aggressive competitors. So whilst feudal restlessness leads to an excess of wars and, and, uh, and wranglings, capitalist restlessness, itself a product of numerous capitalists seeking security, results in a tendency towards overproduction relative to market capacity and thus economic crises. <coughs> the directly producing and the exploiting classes are definite economic agents. They have an interest in maintaining and defettering certain modes of, and relations of production. Bureaucrats in a commercial society, um, and that Marxist, that notorious Marxist category, the lump and proletariat, have no such relationship to determinate modes of production. As such, they attach themselves to the productive classes as rent seekers. They offer services or indulge in a grievous leverage. They fe- the fetter on their mode of existence is the prospect of the productive classes emanci- emancipating themselves from their exactions. Their ideal is one of indispensability. So if you like, direct producers have, you know, Marx sees direct producers having determinate class consciousness. Uh, Marx sees exploiters as having determinate class consciousness. Uh, but the lumpen proletariat don't have a determinate class consciousness because they are essentially parasitic. Um, I was trying to work out where academics fit into the schema, and I suspect lumpen proletariat is where it is. But um, uh, so sorry, Mike. Um, yeah. um, so the proletariat. The proletariat is best considered as a subcategory of direct producers. Like the slave, like the peasant, like the artisan, they seek security. They don't seek transcendence, they don't seek um, some noble ideal, they seek security. Unlike the slave, unlike the peasant and unlike the artisan, they cannot secure their labour power other than, other than by winning the right to work. The right to work can only be guaranteed by the collective control of production. For the proletarian, individualised private productive property is, um, is not an option. They cannot individualise the production process, at least once production has been really subsumed under capital. As Marx put it, since the development of the specifically capitalist mode of production, it is not the individual worker, but rather a socially combined labour capacity that is more and more the real executor of the labour process as a whole. It is a matter of complete indifference, he says, whether the function of the individual worker, who is only a constituent element of this total worker, stands close to direct manual labour or is far away from it. All such workers can only secure their stake in the labour process by securing with their fellows ownership over all of it. As Marx put it in the German ideology, modern universal intercourse, economic intercourse, can be controlled by individuals only when controlled by all. And this is in contrast to the peasant or the artisan who can own his own farm, his own workshop. He says the proletariat can only collectively own the means of production. So they, they wish to own, they wish to possess, but they can only do so collectively. 
And in doing so, in emancipating themselves, the proletariat willy-nilly um, abolishes private property and productive resources. This in turn, Marx believed, as did socialists generally, uh, would mean the end of the bifurcation of involute civil society of, based upon egoistic pr uh, private property owners on the one hand and a distinct, and a distinct political um, sphere on the other. A society without private productive property allows for civil society to subsume the state and to recast it as a functional administration of universal interests. So it's important here to register, therefore, that Marx isn't saying the proletariat, um, out of the beauty of their souls, um, a, uh, imagine a world without private property, imagine a world, um, or rather, they imagine a world where um, a egotistic civil society and political, um, parasitic, a uh, political society, have been, uh, the division has been overcome and there's a new kind of um, uh, universality of interests. Marx saw proletarian consciousness as alienated. In its defence of labour power against all comers, proletarian consciousness expresses the denial of the reality that individual potential is actualised through intercourse with others. Collectiv collectivism, Marx says, arises as the goal of the proletariat, not because the proletariat has transcended alienation, Proletarian consciousness is an instance of alienation. However, collectivism, though established to protect individual labour power against society, in turn clarifies the mutual interdependence of numerous individuals. It doesn't establish this mutual independence, which is already um, present in capitalism in alienated form. It does render, however, such mutual reliance both transparent and in time consensual. This is why, um, famously critique of the Gotha programme, socialism grows over into a higher stage. The higher stage, communism, is the resolution of the divide between individual and totality. But this resolution does not derive directly from proletarian class consciousness. It arises from the withering of class consciousness as a definitively defettered proletarian condition of existence allows for and gives way to truly human relations between individuals. Okay, um, there's about one place I think where Marx is kind of halfway um, clear about what he means. Uh, one place only, I think, but um, I think I can find it. There we go. Um, he let it out as a, the um, a, a preamble to the programme of the um, French Workers' Party in 1880. Um, Engels, in a read it, was amazed that for a change Marx had been clear and to the point. Um, it says, considering that the emancipation of the productive classes is that all human beings um, is that of all human beings without distinction of sex or race that producers can only be free when they, are, when they are in possession of the means of production. So producers wish to possess the means of production. There are only two forms under which the means of production can belong to producers. First of all, the individual form, which has never existed in a general state and which is increasingly eliminated by industrial progress. Secondly, the collective form of the uh, form, sorry, the collective form, the material and intellectual elements of which are constituted by the very development of capitalist society. Therefore, collective appropriation under capitalism, the securing of the individual property of proletarians, that of labour power, can only be done collectively. Once revolution, uh, proletarian revolution, has collectivised the means of production, then and only then can a, um, the higher stage of socialism develop. As Marx puts it in the Grundriss, reciprocal dependence has first to be produced in its pure form before it is possible to think of a real social communality. 
It is therefore when um, through um, collective ownership of the means of production that the, relation, the um, dependence of each uh, person on every, everybody else becomes clear, unmediated, unexploitative, only then uh, can a real social communality develop. That is, uh, the sense that we actualize our individual potential through uh, a uh, interdependence. We don't retreat upon our own private property. Okay. Jump ahead here a bit. Okay, um, in my view, Karl uh, Kautsky accurately summarised Marx's views on the origins of proletarian socialist formation, or will to socialism, as he put it, uh, in his famous polemic with Lenin in 1919. Um, he's trying to make an argument that socialism is impossible in Russia because you don't have a sufficiently large uh, proletariat and you don't have a, um, a, a society where the means of production. Um, have become collectivised under capitalism to the extent that a majority of the population see emancipation uh, of their uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, see their emancipation as um, being through collective ownership of the means of production. As he said, he who happens to be without property, that is, uh, well, yeah, he who happens to be without property conceives his ideal to be the acquirement of small possession. Uh, so a farm or a workshop or something. Small production always creates the will to uphold or to obtain private property in the means of production which are in vogue, not the will to social property, to socialism. Workers engaged in large industry cannot obtain a share in the means of production unless they take on a social form. Therefore, the will to socialism is only applicable when you have large-scale integrated means of production. This creates um, a situation where the small producer, the proletarian, sees self-emancipation only through collective ownership, only through socialism. In the absence of large-scale production, the small producer will see, collect, will see emancipation through owning their own farm or, or their own workshop. So historically directed producers, Kautsky says, have attempted to emancipate and secure uh, individual, the individual property by which they live. The working class are, under conditions of capitalism, only to have individual security through collective ownership. Now how does this stand with the notorious Kautskyan formula, notoriously again adopted by Lenin um, in What Is To Be Done, and you all know about that, that socialist consciousness can only come to the proletariat from outside? In my view, looking back on these formulae, which were unexceptional uh, in second international circles, uh, with a hindsight to Bolshevik communist experience, makes a mountain out of a molehill. Now, Kautsky did argue that a fully, fully worked up pro party programme does require dedicated committee work. The economic and historical theorising of socialist thinkers was likewise a product of intellectuals. This, however, is a pretty unexceptional claim, and it left the notion of proletarian socialist instincts intact. Um, Kautsky at one point explicitly says that, yes, the workers can't spontaneously come up with elaborate socialist theory, but they do spontaneously have socialist inclinations, and he says that explicitly. Given the importance of socialist instinct for Kautsky, the conclusion that he, that he drew uh, was logical, if still surprising given our assumptions. He argues uh, in various places, but most, most notably in um, a 1903, I think, uh, pamphlet, um, The Social Revolution and On the Morrow of the Social Revolution. It's, a, it's in the second half, On the Morrow of the Socialist Revolution. Um, he argues that there actually isn't a need for a socialist party to bring about socialism. 
All that was required was that the proletariat hold political power and not be hindered from acting on their class interests, instincts. To secure the property of wage labour, workers must be guaranteed the right to work. But the right to work must necessarily disrupt the capitalist market and break the power of capitalist managers to manage, particularly if the state is backing up strikers or whatever. Capitalism would implode in these circumstances, Kautsky thought optimistically. Capitalists indeed would beg to have their enterprises socialised so they could at least exact something by way of compensation. And so the example Kautsky used is say, let's say you have a workers' uh, government in Britain where you don't really have a socialist party in 1903, um, but nothing's holding them back. Uh, you would have the right to work to be instituted because this is the socialist instinct. Strikes would happen, this is the socialist instinct. The, work, the capitalists would go, oh my God, we can't make profits anymore, please nationalise the top 200 monopolies, um, and socialism would be instituted. The point is making here is that um, socialism is instinctive to the proletariat, given the means by which they live. Just as peasants don't need a political party to tell them you might want to own your own farm, workers don't need a political party to tell them that the right to work um, is necessary uh, for their mode of existence, and this leads with inexorable logic, Kautsky argues, to socialist revolution. Okay. <coughs> Jump over a few things. Um, interestingly, this argument is taken up by Trotsky. Um, I think Mike talked about permanent revolution yesterday, so sorry for any of my egregious errors, but I'll plow on ahead nevertheless. Um, a, if you look at results and prospects, um, a, Trotsky is clearly very influenced by um, a, um, Kautsky. Indeed, he virtually paraphrases Kautsky in sections of it, um, both a, um, the class struggle, the discussion of the Air program, but also on the more of the social revolution. Um, Trotsky here makes the argument that um, a, if the proletariat come to political power, they shall be driven by class interests which are inexorable, the iron logic of their class interests, that the proletariat in power must necessarily go beyond the limits of capitalism, because this is the nature of a proletarian consciousness. So he says, look what Kautsky says about what would happen if the proletariat take power in Britain. They would, uh, whether you have a socialist party or not, the working class in power will move towards the negation of capitalism because this is an inexorable development of class consciousness. And Trotsky argues, therefore, in results and prospects, that the same would happen in a Russia. So you get all kinds of people like Kautsky saying, yes, absolutely, the proletariat can be the leading power in the night in, in revolution in Russia, um, they're the leading force in 1905, and so on and so forth. Um, they can push the bourgeois revolution to its limits. Um, a Kautsky, for example, anticipated um, a, actually uh, quite far limits. Kautsky anticipated the nationalisation of some of the na natural monopolies, for example, such as mines and oil and so on. Um, and Kautsky also anticipated an alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry, which would lead to a redistribution of land. And Kautsky said the best outcome would be kind of like the United States, the complete elimination of any feudal remnants, the complete elimination of large-scale uh, um, <coughs> quasi-feudal uh, land ownership. And the kind of United States with its social tinge, that's as far as it could go, Kautsky argued, uh, in Russia. Uh, but Trotsky made the argument, by Kautsky's own logic, that the proletariat would not limit itself um, a, in its class aims and ambitions, uh, because the inexorability of class struggle couldn't be restrained um, a, oh well, could be restrained, but uh, the inexorability of class struggle goes beyond any party programme, goes beyond any theory about this being a bourgeois revolution or a bourgeois democratic revolution. It would move beyond that. It would move into the phase of the socialist revolution. Um, 
And this is the theory of permanent revolution, essentially. Uh, precisely for this reason, the bourgeoisie would get even more nervous about uh, revolution. Uh, the proletariat would inherit the democratic bourgeois revolution, uh, but once in power, the proletariat necessarily would move towards socialism. Whether socialism would survive in a country which wasn't ready for socialism would depend upon the detonation of the international revolution. Uh, this was the notion of the permanent revolution. <coughs> Am I doing? Uh, yeah, just for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, it's right. grand, yeah. Okay, um, I'll just move on quickly, um, and I will finish in 10 minutes. Um, now, um, I think what becomes complex about the nature, or what becomes uh, tricky when it comes to the nature of spontaneous socialist preference formation is around the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it's worth bearing in mind what revolution means here. Revolution means the violent overthrow of the state. Revolution doesn't essentially mean nationalising things. That's the growing over stage, and this is something which is held in common by social democrats and by communists. Uh, when they talk about revolution in 1914, they mean civil war, and Lenin says this repeatedly, and civil war is not a metaphor, civil war is literal. Civil war for the, for the Bolsheviks, for the communists, is um, a, the armed destruction of the pre-existing state apparatus. And indeed, a civil war means the replacement of the pre-existing state apparatus. In 1919, when the um, a, uh, common turn uh, is first set up, the issue manifesto to the entire world, or the new communist manifesto, uh, as it's called at the time very often. Um, what's interesting about the new communist manifesto is that it virtually doesn't mention the party at all. What it mentions is councils, Soviets, and it mentions these not as kind of nice, happy, clappy organisations that people get together and uh, be all super democratic with each other. They are posited as alternatives to the existing state apparatus. It is about the disintegration of the existing state apparatus and a, a civil war between these new proletarian, this new proletarian apparatus of power and the old declining uh, bourgeois, younger, semi-feudal, semi-aristocratic um, institutions of power. It's about taking um, civil servants out, um, judges out, policemen out, soldiers out, officers out, and shooting them. Um, that's what's meant by revolution um, in the, the early days of the common term. It's quite a big change when you get to the 21 demands and the 21, uh, the 21 conditions for being a uh, 20, 21, isn't it? Uh, conditions for joining the common turn in 1920. Then, in fact, the Soviets are still there, but they downgrade it quite a lot. It becomes about the party. Um, it becomes about a party which is ideologically pure. It's about getting rid of your revolutionary syndicalists, getting rid of your centrists. It's about expelling people. Um, and in fact, expelling people is, is, is literally, people are named in the 21 conditions. It's about the establishment of a uh, theoretically pure party. And so there's a move here, if you like, from a, uh, the 1917 notion of revolution, which is the idea of civil war, um, a, based upon workers' councils, to um, a 1921, uh, 1920 view of revolution. Civil war is still there. But unsurprisingly, given um, the decline of uh, the Soviets and Russia itself, the party has come to take the place of um, a, uh, the combat party has come to take the place of the Soviets. But again, it's very much a combat party. Kautsky had um, said, well, what does the party do? The party, what are the modes of class struggle? It is parliamentary uh, work. It is um, agitational work through the press. It is trade union work. Um, that's not the view of the communist parties. The communist parties is you set up insurrectionary groups, you subvert the army, um, you uh, draw up lists of people to be shot come the happy day. Um, it's a combat organisation in the most literal sense. Uh, and so a cult of the party is developing. Um, and Lukács, who has a huge impact um, years later when he's writing about history and class consciousness, 
Um, it's kind of caught between this development. Lukács had been uh, very impressed by kind of um, councilism and Sovietism and this kind of thing. Um, and a history and class consciousness is trying to bridge the gap here between um, councilism, Sovietism on the one hand, and the party on the other. But he's also dealing with the fundamental problem. It may well be the case that socialist preference formation means that um, as a worker, you want the right to work. It means that as a worker, as a proletarian, you'll support a party which will, neg uh, which will tend to negate private property and the means of production. It may well mean that socialist preference formation in this sense means that yes, you'll um, vote generally for anything which is likely to secure conditions of existence. And this will have an anti-capitalist tendency depending on how well capitalism can accommodate security of wage labour. What, however, um, this notion of socialist pre preference formation doesn't indicate is that you come up with the correct notion about how to, uh, how to destroy uh, the old bourgeois state. You don't come up with an elaborated political programme. But communism is predicated on an elaborate political program. It's predicated not on nationalizing things, not on limiting the market, because there's agreement between social democracy and communism about limiting the market. There's an agreement that that's what socialism is about. There's also an agreement by the 1920s that you can't hurry about it, you can't be too speedy about it. You have the development, uh, you know, Hill Ferding talking about organized capitalism in Germany. In Russia, you've got the new economic policy. So the notion that yes, you, you negate the market, but you do it gradually. There's agreement here. Um, what the communists want to point out though is that what defines a true revolutionary is somebody who's prepared to join a party which is a combat organisation which is going to levy civil war. And what Lukács is doing is saying um, this is how we describe genuine socialist consciousness. But of course once you do that, once you have a very specific political project, you can no longer infer socialist consciousness directly from the, means, uh, uh, the, from the conditions of existence. There's nothing in anybody's conditions, social conditions of existence which will convince you that the way forward is um, shooting appropriate people. Therefore, socialist consciousness is essentially being redefined by Lukács. It's been defined not as a preference towards securing uh, um, conditions of existence, uh, or uh, uh, rather it's not been defined as preferences arising out of a desire to secure conditions of existence. Socialist consciousness has been redefined as joining the Communist Party. Because of this, therefore, Lukács has to um, a relocate socialist consciousness in a directly political sphere, um, which is based upon um, a, a, a holistic understanding of what needs to be done. This can only be done by an elite which has a rounded understanding of what needs to be done politically. And this can only be found in a party. And therefore, the party becomes uh, the genuine vehicle for socialist consciousness, which is imputed into the working class or ascribed to the working class. And so, if you like, socialist consciousness is turned upside down here. Socialist consciousness becomes a function of tactics and, tra and, and strategy of revolutionary struggle. It moves away from the notion of the proletarian imaginaire of what the, the future would be. I think Lukács does develop logically from what Lenin had said. If you look at Lenin, I mean, Lenin's writings, um, in large TV, he's written about this obviously, but Lenin's writings at the time of what is to be done, um, a, uh, what he's emphasising actually at the time is what, what the proletariat need to understand is that they have to limit their political, political project, that they have to learn to show solidarity of the liberal bourgeoisie and to show solidarity of the peasantry, that only um, they need therefore a fully rounded understanding of the entirety of Russian society. Now this kind of fully rounded understanding is only something which can be developed through political ratiocination. It cannot be instinctual. And therefore, logically enough, um, Lenin is driven to the notion of the revolutionary party, which imputes the correct understanding to the working class. 
However, Lenin doesn't go to the extent of saying that you don't have spontaneous socialist preference formation amongst the working class. He doesn't go that far. Lukács, however, does go that far. And this, if you like, is the development of an orthodox communist understanding of class consciousness. It is imputed, it is ascribed. Lukács goes too far in the 1920s and gets pulled up for it. But in fact, it is, it is a logical understanding of, um, of what communism was about in the late 10s, early 20s. OK, I think I'll finish there. Access of property, which is labour power, uh, which is the ability to labour. Um, they want to live by this, this property form. Uh, the, and this means wages which are adequate and regular. And this means joining trade unions. Um, and the reforms won by trade unions, by the eight hour day or nine hour day or something, that Marx says is the first triumph of the political economy of the working class when he applies it to Britain. Um, this is a negation. This is, trade unions are a semi negation of the free market. To that extent, they are expressive of um, a socialist preference formation. Uh, now, what, what, uh, uh, now, Marx expected this um, to nevertheless come up the limits of the free market. The free market of capitalism would disintegrate attempts to regulate um, a capitalism. Therefore, there'd have to be, in the end, uh, a complete negation of capitalism, the collective ownership of the means of production. Now, it might, it might be the case that, in fact, capitalism does provide um, a, for most uh, people in um, advanced countries wages which are adequate and reliable and regular. Therefore, uh, maintaining one's property by uh, maintaining the property by which one exists uh, might be something which is secured within capitalism. At any rate, that's the basis of reformism. The idea that in fact you don't need to entirely negate capitalism to secure the mode by which you live. That, had, that wasn't Marx's expectation, but I suppose what I'm disagreeing with um, would be, at least imputing to Marx, uh, the notion that trade unions emerge and, and, and divert people away from spontaneous socialist pre preference formation. Trade unions is an instance of socialist preference formation, and it's, it is alienated, yes, it, does, it is workers looking upon themselves as setting labour, but that's the basis of socialist preference formation. It's not in contradiction to it. Workers don't become socialist because they see beyond um, a um, uh, um, see beyond the kind of egocentrism of um, being a wage earner. It's the basis of being uh, the egocentrism of being a wage earner, uh, of protecting your own property, your own ability to labour for wages, can only be preserved collectively. And it's through collectivism that you have the negation eventually of this kind of alienated consciousness. But, but the modification of the labour power cannot be the basis of a socialist consciousness. And, but that's my point, and it is. Yeah, I don't know where we disagree. Yeah, yeah, that's my, um, th this is why Marx says that it's, it's, oh, it's, it's the, the growing over uh, after decommodification, then you grow over into a higher stage, which is communism. But what produces um, socialist consciousness is precisely commodification. Precisely commodification produces socialist consciousness. Because if you don't do commodification, then um, the, the direct producers instead will seek to retire into themselves, to own their own farm, to own their own workshop. It's only when you have an entirely commodified society that the only way by which you preserve your individual property is through collective ownership. So proletarian consciousness um, brings about a situation which makes for socialism, but proletarian consciousness is not a transcendence of alienation, it's not a transcendence of commodification. If anything it's spontaneism um, towards too much socialism, and this is the point about the economist deviation, the economists are not saying um, the workers are just all super, super reformists. They're saying the workers are spontaneously socialist and we should give them their head. And the debates against spontaneism, or the argument against it um, a, by people like Lenin, is to say we have to restrain the working class simply operating of their own class consciousness because you've got a much more complex um, task at hand, which is overthrowing czarism, which means we have to have an orientation towards. Um, a, the bourgeoisie, the liberal bourgeoisie towards the peasantry and all, and all that kind of thing. And so the way it tends to be looked at now, spontaneism is that a spontaneous evolution towards non-socialism and you need a party to hold it back. It's precisely inverted in the debates at the turn of the century. 
And this is why someone like Trotsky, for example, is essentially in the economistic tradition that the working classes will spontaneously develop socialist ideology and you can't hold them back, therefore permanent revolution, you know. And nobody really debate and nobody really disputes that. So the dispute is what does the party do? Does the party hold back um, a um, uh, if you like a kind of class narcissism for the greater good of the democratic revolution in Russia. And that's fundamentally what what is uh, what what is to be done is talking about. You know, uh, I mean, I agree with Lars Daly that most of it is actually pretty unexceptionable, um, except for the bit where uh, Lars Daly himself says, "I'm not really sure how to explain this," which is why he leaves it at the very end of the book. You know, where um, a Lenin says something like, "They'll." spontaneously develop bourgeois ideology if we don't stop them, which doesn't really fit into the rest of the book, and it's certainly completely alien to the Second International. Uh, that idea is just completely alien, um, and he's taken up for it. You know, and I don't think he makes much attempt to defend it either. You know, there is something odd in what is to be done, even even with normalisation of it. You know, um, I mean, the real odd thing at the time is the 1903 split, where Plekhanov comes up and says. Um, a, the revolution is the highest law. We should be prepared to negate democracy if need be. Come the revolution, that's what's important for the future. You know that can be that can be contextualised. That's far more important, I think, than what is to be done. You know. Um, so yeah. So on spontaneism and spontaneism too. I mean, when people are talking about it, so within uh, a debate um, a, within wider socialism, where the spontaneists are those who are um, setting up commune republics every three weeks in Italian villages. You know, that's what's considered to be spontaneous. It's, it's revolutionary radicalism. So the notion of the spontaneous development of the working class is away from socialism, is not what they're talking about at all. In a way, that's what Lukács invents as, um, a, or projects back onto the debate. And as somebody said quite rightly, it's what the SWP argued. Um, it's amazing that, well, at least John Reese, I don't know how much SWP did generally, but John Reese's enthusiasm for um, Lukács is, is just amazing. No, but, um, uh, yeah, well, he's, he's not the guy I would have picked Lukács if I was going to lionise anybody, but um, uh, so I think it's quite strange. Um, uh, um, yeah, the point there about stratification of the working class. I think I think a genuine problem which Marx doesn't particularly confront with uh, confront is that there is a tendency for workers, he argues, to um, collectively protect the means by which they live, which um, a, this means organising in trade unions and it means building up uh, to a position where you collectivise the means of production, and in that way you can protect the means by which um, uh, you are living. You protect your, your wages. But of course, there's, there's different ways you might do that. You might do it through something you'd call uh, democratic socialism, uh, but you might also do it by um, a, precisely through stratification, that if you're protecting your own income, and this is, this is what craft unionism is all about. It's about saying, at least our jobs are secure by excluding other workers from the labour market. Uh, and the 20th century sees all manner of horrible permutations of this. Uh, racism, fascism and so on, um, all had inflections which were directed towards the working class and found an echo in the working class that your job is secure by saying, well, you know, jobs are whites or whatever, or, um, a, or, or yes, uh, there is a, a racial or national community which must protect the dignity of labour and therefore guarantee work. There's all manner of ways in which the, pre uh, the kind of spontaneous ideology of socialist pre preference formation can express itself. Uh, not all of them terribly pleasant. Um, most of them not terribly pleasant. You know, um, Marx and even more Engels. Marx is always a bit ambivalent about the spontaneous uh, democratic liberalism of the working class. Uh, Marx is very clear. Uh, up until about 1850-51, the, the bourgeoisie are spontaneously democratic and liberal. Um, he's never not so clear about it, funny enough, when it comes to the working class. Uh, later on, Engels is much more saying that be, um, the working class are spontaneously uh, liberal and democratic, I mean, liberal in the broader sense of the term, um, because they need to be, because the only weapon they have is numbers, and therefore they will be democratic. They can't rely upon uh, the kind of uh, uh, privileges which the bourgeoisie accrue and so on. Uh, so Engels is much stronger the idea that if you leave it to the working class, it'll be fine. They'll be democratic in ethos. Uh, they'll be um, uh, Marx, I suspect, is probably a bit more wary about that. 
um, a, which may be one argument about the necessity for a party. Um, a, in Marx's sense, because party means something a bit different from Marx is talking about it. Um, yeah, on um, uh, um, where where does exploitation fit into this? Um, I was rather hoping nobody had asked that because I really don't know. Um, a, as far as I can tell, it doesn't. You know, um, a, and Marx, of course, is funny about exploitation. I mean, there's huge amounts of capital. He says, oh, it's, you know, it's desperate the exploitation goes on. And then he says, yeah, but it's, it's equal exchange. You know, there's an equal exchange between capitalist and worker uh, when it comes to the selling of labour power. Um, there's a certain ambivalence uh, when it comes to exploitation, and I don't see particularly well how it fits into a notion of cla of um, a of, of class consciousness formation. I don't see how it fits in very well. Uh, if for nothing else. The idea that you don't get the full value of labour doesn't end come socialism. It's just a different mechanism by which um, a, an element of what you produce is redistributed away to somebody else. Now, obviously, in a much more voluntary, it's consensual sense. It's you that is, is producing. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. It's the collective mechanism. Oh, yeah. The working class which is redistributed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but, but Marx is forever going on about, no, we're not moral. This is not a moral argument, blah, blah, blah. And, and the morality which... Would, uh, which the working class will bring into revolution is is still a bourgeois morality, as he says in the Critique of the Welfare Program. It's a bourgeois morality, um, he argues, which will be negated in time. You know, so works actually. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have a brilliant answer to it because I really don't know yet. I don't see how it integrates very well. Um, uh, I do know that exploitation has become very, very important for the academic left in the last 30 years, people like Jerry Cohen and so on. They go on about exploitation all the time, but that's because they ha um, they've abandoned the Marxist argument of the working class being spontaneously socialist. They've reconfigured Marxism as being a theory of social movement and a theory of class consciousness and turned it into a moral argument, which is capitalism is bad. Um, that's basically what Jerry Cohen did. Um, they, I shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but, um, but I think with problems of interpretation. So certainly I'd be happy enough to say that the massive emphasis on Cohen and Garrus and all these kinds of people on exploitation is an artifact of a certain evolution of academic mind. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's deliberate. It's not that um, out of the head of the proletarian springs um, a... Uh, um, uh, an entirely coherent worldview, which is going to work necessarily. You know, not all class consciousness actually are viable. I mean, the the, the, the bit I read out from Marx where he says um, there's different ways for the direct producer to be free, either as individual small producers, but he says that's not a ever actually happened. Um, he says this is not a viable form of society. Um, a, Marx might be wrong about that. Uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, there seems to be parts of uh, a Europe where, for a large time, you do basically have. Um, societies based upon small farmers, uh, which are viable for decades uh, before something comes along and pinches it all. But um, a, um, uh, but the point being is that it's quite possible to have a class consciousness which is not functional, which is not viable. Uh, nevertheless, it emerges. You know, um, where is I going with this? Um, yeah, the notion of of, of continuum um, that. A, it's socialist preference formation because what socialist preference means is that, this, in my view, and that's what I think Marx meant, was a desire um, under capitalism, under commodification, to secure the means by which you live. That is the right to work, which requires organisation of the means of production. And this, in turn, will give rise to socialism. But absolutely, it can and historically has expressed itself in all manner of ways, and probably more common than a, um, a attachment to um, a, a kind of socialist principles you'd all be uh, content with. It probably has historically attached itself more to correct, reactionary chauvinisms and exclusivisms, uh, which are other ways to, de uh, to defend your labour power uh, by lumping it on to somebody else. Um, I mean, roughly speaking, when did socialism um, become problematic as, um, uh, as an expression of class consciousness? Uh, I don't think 1917 is uh, actually such a big turning point. 1917 and the period afterwards marks the division between socialism and communism, which is much more about um, what you do with the state structure. Do you go into a civil war or not? That's really what the division is about. 
Uh, the idea that the, the, um, the market has to be transcended to a greater or lesser extent is probably more and more working class common sense up until about the end of the 1960s. Um, there has been a turn back um, a, since about the end of the 1960s in the neoliberal period and the reasons of that are uh, various and many. Um, uh, it's partially because in practice nationalisation and welfareism were seen uh, by sections of the working class to undermine the integrity of wage labour actually. I think it's one of the reasons why people turned against it. Um, not a, some of these reasons were, had foundations, some of these reasons didn't have foundations, you know. Um, a, but I think what happened was not the absence of socialist ideologues since the 1960s thereabouts. What happened has been structural changes in the labour market, structural changes in the nature of capitalism, um, and things, the decline of uh, a mass socialist culture and so on, are compared to that not as important, or they're a secondary effect. Fundamentally, I think you know. Um, having said that, I still uh, and wage labour itself has, has become much more complex. Um, there's a much smaller section of the working class who are now entirely dependent upon wage labour, and there's been a deliberate attempt, um, which has been successful to a greater or lesser extent since at least the 1970s in the advanced capitalist countries, to generalise and to spread non-proletarian modes of wealth in terms of privatisation, share ownership, house ownership. Um, a, a, um, a social insurance instruments uh, being connected to the stock market and so on. This has been a conscious attempt to, if you like, generalise uh, or to spread, to diffuse non-working class modes of existence, um, to adulterate, if you like, the working class mode of existence. And one of the significant reasons I've done it, um, political elites are quite conscious about this, is because it tends to turn people away from the left. It tends to turn them towards the right. Part of the impact of spreading home ownership in the 1980s was, um, a, uh, was a direct correlation with um, the, uh, votes going to the Conservative Party. Um, a right-wing um, uh, right thinkers in America are absolutely explicit that by spreading, by diffusing wealth, by democratization of capital, you bolster right-wing political projects as against left-wing political projects. So the notion that arising out of the working class mode of existence is a tendency towards uh, collectivism, which more or less tends to be a left-wing collectivism, is something which is widely acknowledged and has been widely acknowledged for a long time, not just by political parties, um, but it's been widely acknowledged by theorists, if you like, of capital, to put it that way. And part of the structuring of society in the last in neoliberalism has been to counter that. Now, that's not the, been the only thing going on with neoliberalism. A lot of us to do with uh, the structure of production generally and that kind of thing. Um, nor is it once and for all, and I'm not arguing for a disintegration of the working class here. In fact, um, wage labour remains the predominant way by which people make a living. Um, Spenner is saying it's much wider than people who just work in factories. Um, and even if you do own your own house, well, you know, it's, it's not a way by which you live, you know. I mean, okay, you could flog your house and live off the proceeds for a number of years, um, but it's not the same as having a farm or a workshop which you, you know, or you know, a shop or something, which you actually defend that mode of small prop, uh, productive property. So I'm not saying that this diffusion of bourgeois assets has destroyed the working class, um, a, but it has had an impact, unquestionably. Um, part of it has been a destabilizing impact. Uh, it's been connected with the financialization of capital since the 1970s, which is um, the, the recent recession, whatever we call it these days, um, the, the Great Recession, um, has been connected partially to unsecured loans and so on. But unsecured loans has, arise, has arisen, particularly in America, as a deliberate way to turn voters to the right. They've done it explicitly and deliberately, that's why they did it, you know, to undermine collectivist left-wing projects. Um, uh, and this is when they weren't confronted by anything terribly terrifying, Lord knows what happens otherwise, you know. Um, a, so yeah, yeah. Um, a, uh, other aspects, um, a, I mean, not much about me talking about what has to be done, because you, get, you had Lars here talking about it, he knows much more about it, you know. I would make the point not so much about that Lenin saying, let's hold back the workers, but he's saying, let's stop the workers being spontaneously spontaneously only into their own class interests that's what they cons that's what they fear because if they're only into their own class interests they all end up pissing off the peasants and the liberal bourgeoisie 
that is what the political party is there to do. It is basically class collaborationist. That is what Lenin is arguing for and wants to be done. You know. um, <coughs> And, has a good, and that's what all the economists are, economists are saying. Look, the working class don't care about czarism as such. They want to, they want to fight the bourgeoisie and to, um, to uh, move towards socialism. What, there can, what really I think people at Lenin are frightened of is a kind of LaSalle style socialism where um, workers get interest. You know, you get um, you know, LaSalle had said you know, um, there might be some kind of alliance between Bismarck and the working class with the state will finance workers' cooperatives. The concern, really, the function of the party is to keep the eye on the democratic ball. Um, it's not to stop workers going off and becoming non-socialist. That's not really the problem as far as Lenin's concerned. You know. There are complications, though, because it's a complex pamphlet, because it's a polemical pamphlet, and Lenin is just always unfair with everybody he ever debates with. You know. So much is made of Credo, which is an economistic um, pamphlet, which is utterly unrepresentative. You know. um, and away, part of the point I wanted to make is that if you take economism, the spontaneous development of socialism within the working class milieu, the way that works out most consistently is in Trotsky. It's the basis of the permanent revolution. Um, a, and it has been uh, a. Um, uh, Trotsky's basically an economist uh, of a particular kind. You know. um, why does what is to be done? I mean, what's pro I mean, one thing which I think, to be fair, Lars, Lars in that huge book, and you know, Lars makes the good point, it's, at the t it's not really a very important book. Uh, I'd hate to see the length of Lars' commentary in an important book, but um, uh, it's not a terribly important book. But it does become important in retrospect. I mean, Lukács um, uses it, and Gramsci and all these people use it as central. You know, it becomes absolutely totemic for the communist movement. You know, um, yeah, you can't let the communists off the hook for it. That's for sure. You know, uh, militarization, militarization of labour. Yep, um, one party state. You know, and that's they're already there. Um, that's problematic. Um, if you like militarization of labour, well, one might have thought it'd be the um, icing in the cake, but there's a lot worse to come. But um, a, um, uh, yeah, and uh, of course, the engine of the discussion, another debate there. Lenin in 1917, on his argument with Kamen Evans and Zinoviev, Kamen Evans and Zinoviev says, "Look, we have, we don't have a majority in the country. If we try and take power, it'll be undemocratically." And in fact, they predict the percentage uh, of seats, or I think they, they predict the percentage of votes that the Bolsheviks would get in the Constituent Assembly, and they're absolutely right actually, they predict it correctly, you know, so they know what they're talking about. Lenin's response of course is, ah, but with the left socialist revolutionaries, then we are a majority, and that's much more problematic because who exactly are the left socialist revolutionaries and so on and so forth, very complex. Depends a bit on what Lenin means, you know, do, does Lenin really think he is a democratic majority in 1917 or not? I'm not sure, it'd be interesting to see what Lars think. But certainly within a year, democratic majority, no, 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 that's all gone, you know. Um, uh, sorry? Brestitov's got to be a big I, I think Brestitov's a big mistake, actually. I think, um, uh, I think the left were right, they shouldn't have signed Brestitov's, but that's another debate. I, I, think, I think it's quite plausible not to sign it, and that's the big mistake. Um, uh, because when half the country was mad at them then, because they'd sold the country out. You know, um, there's plenty of people who don't think much of the Bolsheviks, but they're, they're not a government. You know, uh, um, when they sell you out to the Germans, that's a bit different. You know, that's a mistake. Uh, it's, it's actually, there's an article, Lenin almost says that, an article about 1921 or something. He says, you can just kind of see him writing, going, Brestvotovsk. Not sure, you know, so to have a suspicion, that's what goes wrong. We'll get to clap now. Oh, yeah. <laughs>